Would you uh, welcome Craig Cheney? I'm going to just do a little interview with Craig in this process. Craig, come on up. So as part of our Mission 3.0 team, you've met Jonathan, and Jonathan's doing some work with me and uh, in terms of training and curriculum and workshops and coaching, and we're, we've got peer uh, learning communities that we'll be starting in January in which we'll be taking four or five or six churches through a two-year process. If you've got a church that would like to be a part of that, we'll... Every six months, we'll bring you together. We'll actually help you create strategies for the next six months. And you'll do it with six or seven other churches from around the country that are trying to create the same sort of mm -hmm. Mission 3.0 strategies. And it's that peer learning. How can we accelerate one another's learning curves? You go away, you work on those for six months, you come back at the end of those six months, and, you, and we talk now. We report out. What have we learned? What's working? What's not working? And this learning community is going to begin to accelerate what it looks like to mm. do Missions 3.0. Mm. And, uh, and Craig has agreed to come alongside of us and be that person that's helping us uh, in those churches where we're trying to connect this to the, the idea of disciple-making, missional living types of movements, and uh, we're excited to have him work with us in that category. So give us, give us your 30,000-foot uh, view of the process so far of your work here. You're new to this thing, mm -hmm. um, and trying to integrate the kind of stuff that we're talking with Mission 3.0 and the stuff that you've been involved with 3DM and mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Oh, you got it. You got I'm wired. Some, yeah, dangerous. It's dangerous. <laughs> um, well, first of all, just for you to know, uh, for me to be able to express uh, what a privilege it is for me to be a part of Tom's life and Tom's heart, uh, those of you who've known him for a few years just know that he has lived and died almost annually uh, for the things God's put in his heart about this Mission 3.0 expression as it's come to be known. But the front end of that process has been heavily exploratory um, and oftentimes in the context of tremendous noise uh, as deconstruction opens up the way to new construction. And so Tom's really lived in that space very faithfully. And I think it is actually a picture of the process every one of us go through as we respond to what it is God's stirring up in our heart, where the Spirit of God graciously deconstructs what's there presently in the way of the new things he wants to give us. And the scriptures would describe it with the eloquent term, death. You know, it is a journey of death. And as such, it's really inconsistent following and pattern of Jesus' own life. So as Jesus came to offer us what was new, uh, it was only gained, uh, it was only accessible through death, his and then ours, if you will. So I think in terms of the discipleship piece, when it comes to the matter of mission, if our notion of practicing mission is devoid of a picture of death, we'll probably continue to be in a place of doing the very best good work we can do. It just may not, in fact, represent the work of Christ, the work of Jesus in character, if you will, in practice, because it will be absent the essential piece of death itself. So maybe big picture for us, um, at least as a church, is we recognize Jesus has spoken clearly to us. So we have the words of God, the words of Jesus. And we have the works of Jesus. So we can look at the king, bringing the kingdom, breaking through, bringing new, and it's awesome. Um, we love the stories, we love to revisit those. But at times we forget the ways of Jesus. So we have his words and his works, and sometimes that's the path we want to take. We want to hear his words and then and go do. And his own practice was, uh, come follow me, and I will invite you into the kind of life that will enable you to do the works I'm going to show you. So words of God, words of Jesus, ways of Jesus, and then the works of Jesus. So seeing those combined together, to provide a powerful union of marketplace and ministry, uh, both in language and in conduct, as Jesus did. So my conviction is that if we're looking for the best business builder, it's reasonable to look at Jesus. I mean, think about it for a moment. I don't know exactly what your business may be, but at least as John's description starts out, we could honestly say in that moment he was the best bartender 
Would that be fair to say? <laughs> Regardless of your view of alcohol. I mean, it's just, he wasn't bothered by an existing view of alcohol. He just made the very best available at that moment. Um, best restaurant tour, or at least food service provider, you know, in a moment to multitudes, very satisfactory, you know. And I gather it was very economical. So somehow in the conduct of Jesus, no matter what the endeavor was, fishing, farming, I mean, pick your space. Uh, it's fair to say Jesus was the best in that space. I think the challenge is at times we've been limited in seeing him for who he is in the spaces you and I live everyday life in. And the church has been a co-conspirator uh, to that limited perspective, and so we see Jesus in these spiritual spaces, and we don't see him in our everyday spaces. And as a result, we go about everyday mission effort, um, sometimes missing some of the best of Jesus in that. So, so as you think of um, your vision for this church and, and it's in terms of the kind of, of church you envision, the kind of disciples you see this church raising up. Describe that vision or that, that end goal. Yeah. Um, I think for us, it's the desire to embrace the character and the competency of Jesus and then to express it in a way that is in and of itself multiplying in the lives of others and it's producing genuine transformation in community. So embracing a posture of dissent so we're learning uh, in humility, we're listening, uh, we're learning. It's very, uh, it's the kind of posture and perspective that changes who we are. So then the overflow of that and the way we live it out in our day to day is practical, uh, it's real personal. Um, I don't, we don't have a formula for it. So we don't have that to offer, and that may be a good thing, but it can be a frustrating thing if you're looking for the fix that you can just act on. Um, it's something deeper than that, um, but it's, it's ultimately expressed as an overflow of what's really going on. And, and in terms of the importance of this church for disciple making to become not just a personal thing, but a community thing, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that, the role yeah. of community in disciple making. Um, the term that the scriptures would use to describe that kind of community is the term oikos. And so Jesus, again, by his own conduct, created an oikos. He created a spiritual family that he invested in and led on mission. And so he lived out mission with them, but in living out that mission with them, they got him. Um, it became them, and then they expressed it in the community that surrounded them. And as we know by story, it cost all of them their lives. There's that death idea again, just, just by way of story. But in the process, the people whose lives their lives touched got Jesus. And the world was transformed. So as Rodney Stark would describe the impact of the early church um, by 350 AD or so, over 50% of the known world uh, declared a personal faith in God, a personal faith relationship with Jesus. And that was in an era that had almost none of the things available to us today by way of leverage. So uh, I think for uh, Heartland in particular, the desire is to see those in such clear enough and personal enough pictures that we know how to act on them. But the oikos piece of that, to be able to do it in community, um, whether it's a missional community or a missional family, uh, to do it in a oikos-like relationship where spiritual life is growing, missional life is being practiced, and both are experiencing transformation. That would be our desire. One of the things that, uh, th that we have spent a lot of time talking about and wrestling with, and both of us are in this space of saying there's, there's gotta be a way, we're not sure what, exactly what it is. It's the tension between the organic and the organized. Because uh, much of the literature out there on the missional movement in churches is, is uh, heavily on the organic with the theory of change being that if we can just mobilize lots of small communities of people living missionally together and then going out into the community that we can change our world. And that is a great uh, recipe for, um, for the oikini that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. that's, a great, that's a great recipe for creating the sense of oneness and fellowship among that group. But it's also a great recipe for helping that hurts. 
Yes. Because a small group of six to eight people that are in close fellowship with each other tend to find entry points to relief and betterment, and they become incredibly passionate about it. And so mm -hmm. without uh, throwing either side of that under the bus, we're living in that tension between. So how do you encourage the organic that needs to happen in this missional living while, while at the same time recognizing that a church's missions needs to have some aspect of it that is organized. Mm -hmm. It's going to be structured and some it's going to be unstructured. There's going to be centralized and there's going to be decentralized. And mm -hmm. then how do you start defining what gets funded in the centralized versus the decentralized? How do you, and how do you, how do you, um, uh, express worth for the decentralized types of things that are happening, which may not be funded the way that the centralized would be. And then how do you create a vetting process to even decide, I mean, and we haven't figured any of that stuff out <laughs> yet, but I, again, it's, if you're not asking the right questions, you'll never get to the right answer. Yeah. And so we're wrestling with those kinds of things right now because as a church you want to grow the, the, this individuals that have this missional living mindset but then you also want to have the structures and strategies within your church so that you can get to the more complex societal mm -hmm. issues so that's my kind of yeah. now you express you express the same thing i just said in your words well um it's been fun as tom and i have worked together because we've been able to mix language um, and for the most part be able to understand each other it's been really awesome but we recognized as a church, we needed a, needed a framework that could define structure, strategy, pathway, clear pictures that leaders within the church could engage in for wherever they are on the spectrum. So even as Desiree was talking about, as she welcomes volunteers into her world, it's cross spectrum. And we're working to create a framework, again, a structure in which leaders, People within the body can enter wherever they may be in their own development process. If it's exposure, then we want it to be great exposure, well-led, well-modeled, all the way up to entanglement, you know, redemptive entanglement. We want it to represent an authentic expression of where they are in their own journey. But that be organized enough to have structure, resource, accountability, measures, all those things organic enough to know it's yours. And so I think one of the key components that's really been rising for us is the piece of ownership. And building this off of Jesus' own conduct, it's expressed to us um, by him as he finishes Matthew, where he invites us into what I consider to be the most profound volunteer experience, make disciples. I just don't know of any greater, more challenging endeavor than that as a volunteer. Additional framework is given to that, uh, I think, in several places. One that stands out is in 2 Corinthians 5 when Paul's trying to give the Corinthian followers this picture of their partnership with the king bringing the kingdom. And he says, the king has brought the kingdom and it's transforming you personally, powerfully, comprehensively. And by the way, you and I are the representatives of him and of that. And the combination of those for me represents ownership that says, whoa, I get to be about kingdom business and I need to be about it smartly with economic engine pictures that are actually workable, measurable, um, so that that union, um, whether it's marketplace and ministry, in this case, it's kingdom and person and we get to be his agents here, so. This framework, I think, fosters that. So I've, uh, I've enjoyed it um, very much and looking forward to continuing down this road and, and figuring some of this stuff out. So would you join me in thanking Craig and Mr. Thank you, buddy.